three, two, one. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, so, it's so horribly Happy out of sync. Happy birthday, dear Prontis. Happy birthday to you. Atrocious. That was something. (laughs) Singing over four different Wi Fi connections was not a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear. Why why are we singing Happy Birthday, Izzy? Um, because I just had the song in my head and I didn't know how to get rid of it. No, it's because it is Prompted's birthday. Or it was Prompted's birthday on the 13th of January, which I didn't realise until that night. (laughs) Is that our year old? One year old. A year ago today, we were uploading our... No, not today. I don't know. A year ago, we were uploading our first ever episode. Oh, remember when we could actually meet in a radio studio? Do so you want to remember that time? That was so nice. And we went for coffee afterwards. And like before, we'd all like um, help like each other writing in person. Oh, I can't wait to be in person again. But yes, I should probably introduce this episode then, shouldn't I? Once Upon a Time on Prompted Writing Podcast... Izzy writes a fantasy mystery, Erin writes time travel, and special guest Sophie writes a drama about a relationship, and our second special guest, Alex, writes about an academic after hours. This week's theme is settings, and our prompt is, I got you blackberries, you got me brambles. Who are both of you? (laughs) Okay, who are you and what do you write? Yeah, let's, we did just go. break into your <laughs> podcast, so I suppose it's only fair to explain. <laughs> I'm Alex. I'm a creative writing master student. I Ooh. I mainly just write a lot of fantasy fiction uh, and enjoy it greatly. Yeah, fantasy is brilliant. And Sophie, what about you? Uh, hi, my name is Sophie. Um, I did creative writing for my undergraduate degree, uh, where I met a lot of these lovely people. And uh, most of my writing, I write in all sorts of different forms, prose, plays, screenplays. Uh, But most of my writing tends to have uh, a historical angle to it. Uh, And not the piece today, but most of the others are about Richard III. We love Richard III. uh, Do the characters in your piece like Richard III? Now, now, Now see, it's about sort of the, the differences in a relationship. And I feel like if this was a longer piece, that could be a very interesting point of contention. Should we head right into your piece then? I see that's the first one up. Okay, thank you. Uh, the title is Escapism. Uh, so I will just Ooh. get right into it. A primal roar ripped through the tranquility of the cabin as Louis activated the blender. The chunks of multicoloured fruit piled inside instantly transformed into a wall of grainy pinkish red. Louis had been pleasantly surprised when he discovered the blender on their first day, tucked away in the corner of the cupboard and he wondered how the company that ran the getaway retreat could afford to put one in each of the hundreds of cabins. The blender slowed to a halt, and Louis removed the lid, then poured the mixture into a glass. He was wrapped in a grey dressing gown, and its colour matched the polished stone countertops of the kitchen area. The garment had been a present from Simon for his last birthday. Louis heard Simon's phone bleep from inside the bathroom, though the sound was muffled by the monsoon whoosh of the shower. Simon took his phone wherever he went, showing a disregard for its safety that Louis felt it did not deserve after its years of dedicated functionality. Louis's eyes, still dulled from the sleep, began to focus in on his surroundings as he brought the smoothie to his mouth. Apart from the bedroom and bathroom, the entire cabin was open plan. The linoleum kitchen floor suddenly met the beige fluff of the lounge carpet, a nice sensation whenever he strolled barefooted towards the fire in the earliest hour of the morning. The glass screen door led to the patio, and the coals in the barbecue were still flecked with white ash from when they had hosted some fellow holidaymakers a few evenings ago. Beyond the boundary of stone slabs, the natural earth sloped down to a pond, perilously disguised by a layer of solid green matter. A sign warned guests not to fish or swim in the pond. All around the cabins, the pine trees rose like Roman columns, their bark smooth as a shaved leg. They seemed to stand as a challenge, goading wannabe adventurers to try to climb them, for a chance to glimpse the world from their heavenly perspective. As Louis rinsed his glass and loaded it into the dishwasher, he saw a heron dive past the window, skimming the pond's surface before the breeze carried it upwards again. 
he spotted the slight orange flash of a tag on its leg as it soared past. This was the perfect balance, the wilderness with all the peaks of modernity. For a moment, Louis could imagine his entire life taking place in this cabin. First, him and Simon as radiant honeymooners in matching powder blue suits, bursting through the door, their faces colliding and their hands so busy Simon is forced to close the door with his foot. Then as growing parents with two primary age children, a boy and a girl for symmetry, tightly packed into Michelin man coats and Wellington boots, dashing across the kitchen towards the door, eager to dirty their brand new outdoors gear. Then finally, as contented retirees, sitting in front of a fire crackling with yuletide warmth, their heads leaning on one another like a crutch, neither caring that if one of them closed their eyes they might not open them again. Simon pulled open the bathroom door, and steam spilled out around him, like the smoky effects of an alien exiting a spacecraft. A creamy towel stretched from his waist to his ankles. His hair was moist and black and slick as if with gel. Louis approached him and secured his arms around Simon's neck. He quickly and firmly pressed his lips to Simon's before he spoke. So I thought that after you get back, we could... Denise just texted me. Molly's been coughing all night, so she's taking her to the doctor. Despite being near to Simon's steaming body, Louis only felt cold. Are you going to go back then? I don't think I need to yet. Denise will tell me if the doctor says it's anything bad. Simon ducked out of Louis's hold and stepped into the bedroom, closing the door behind him. Louis walked over to his coat hanging in the hallway and checked the pockets to make sure he had cigarettes left. He was still deliberating whether to go out for a smoke in his robe when Simon emerged from the bedroom. His heavy layers of clothing, coat, hat and scarf seemed ridiculous while he was still inside and stood opposite the scantily clad Louis. He brushed past Louis as he went into the hallway to gather his supplies. I won't be gone long. I found a great spot down by the lake. The lighting's perfect this time of day. Uh Uh-huh. Louis concurred. Simon appeared beside him and gave his cheek a peck, subtle as the click of a camera's shutter. See you later. Don't spend all morning in your pyjamas. Louis listened to the thud of the front front door and watched Simon stride past the giant front window, weaving through the greenery like an exhibit in a reptile house. His gaze followed Simon down the gravel path, past the neighbouring cabins and their parked cars. One of their neighbours, sweltering in his running gear, waved to Simon as he jogged past, and Simon waved back. His tripod, zipped into its fabric case and slung across his back, made Simon seem like a gun-wielding hunter. Louis watched him grow smaller until he turned the corner and slid behind the backdrop of foliage. So if Simon was the hunter, then that made Louis the gatherer. He went over to the fridge and pulled out the carton of leftover fruit from their late side picnic the day before. He decided that a nice healthy fruit salad would provide a suitable aftertaste to the rich flavouring of the lasagna he was planning for dinner. He laid the pieces of fruit across the chopping board its many shallow scars one of the few signs that the cabin had been occupied by others before their arrival. He grabbed a slice of sun-yellow melon and diced it into cubes, like blocks in a child's playset. The knife felt heavy in his hand. The scent of Simon's citrus shampoo still hung in the air. He knew his hunter would not return with a prize for him. And that's it, thank Thank you. you. That was beautiful. Oh, thank you. Your imagery was amazing. Mm. You have a very calming voice, so that paired of all the forest imagery was just very relaxing. <laughs> I was oh, going to say, yeah, uh, yeah. There was there was a point towards where I was just sort of uh, feeling very very calm inside. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely narrate your own book one day. You could make a million audio books. Mm. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> the real question is, what voice would Richard the Third have? he'd be in there somewhere so yeah he'd be um, I I think he would have a very calming voice I think he was that kind of person (laughs) put people at ease I love the yeah all of the nature imagery blended with the the sort of modern imagery like you have the dishwasher but then you also have the idea of the hunter and the gatherer and I just thought that was really beautiful how you did that. And I really love, because I know we were talking about settings and locations today. I really love how um, you've described the cabin as a, a woodland paradise. It's got everything they need. And I love the chopping board that's got a few little scratches in to show that 
it's really had a history mm. uh, and the fact that they can just look outside and see the bird and see it so close that you can catch the tag on the bird i thought all of that was just so many beautiful details i thought that was incredible oh, thank you no i really appreciate that no, i agree i think that the moment that really stood out for me was the um uh the pond disguised by a layer of green matter i could i could see that oh. so vividly i uh, just it it uh, it really made me, yeah, it made me feel like I could see the the entire setting, just the whole place. Thank you. That that is actually inspired uh, by a, a childhood incident. I was walking with my parents, saw what I thought was like this white gravel, and stepped on it, and it was just like the sort of discoloured algae on a pond, and I just went oh, straight no. in. So oh, I was thinking yeah. of that when uh, when I saw it, and that sort of that the, the point you get on sort of stagnant water where you're almost deceived into thinking that that it's sort of land and you can step on it <laughs> to your peril. But, so thank you, thank you. I'm glad you. I'm glad that sort of stood out to you. That was awesome. Do you think you'd ever like make it into a longer piece and sort of retrack where the relationship is going? Um. Yeah. What's kind of interesting is that this. Uh, actually started out as uh, something a bit longer and then uh, I sort of naturally went away and kind of trimmed it down and I think what Mm. sort of almost weirdly kind of stood out to me to this was like sort of that one sort of snapshot of this relationship almost kind of spoke volumes about you know a whole life together Mm. in a weird way but um, it would be great to sort of go back and kind of look at sort of what their home life is because obviously this sort of snapshot is just them on holiday and trying to get away from home so it's like well, what are they getting away from what is at home oh that's so beautiful the way that you've done that yeah i'd love to read the rest if you ever develop the piece no oh, well thank you very much uh, you, you i'll uh i'll make sure you guys are the first to read it if i ever uh mm. expand oh, on it thanks. oh heck yes so alex should we move on to your piece um, yeah Izzy, there was not even a segue there. Come on. Come <laughs> on, you go on. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so speaking about longer pieces, Alex is, I'm going to say, the tallest out of all of us, but I know Erin is quite tall. <laughs> um, I, I can't actually remember the last time I stood up next to Alex. No, I was going to say, I can't he's either. Than me. It, it, yeah, I was going to say, it must have been like a month or so ago, but I think we're nearly the same height. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so we'll go to Alex's piece. Thank you, Izzy. And may I say what a beautiful segue that is that you rode in on. <laughs> that was glorious. <laughs> um, yeah, so I uh, I tentatively titled my piece Late Night Writing. Um, <laughs> uh, ironically did it this morning. Um, and yeah. I, I was going to ask if that was the title or just a description. It's just what I was thinking at the time. <laughs> just was uh, late night writing. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, uh, if you're ready, I'll, I'll happily dive in. Go ahead. Yeah, go for it. The bramble plant seems to be something of an evolutionary dichotomy. Beautiful, succulent fruit guarded by sharp, piercing thorns. The point of the fruit is to be eaten so that animals might spread the seed around and more brambles might grow in faraway places. Yet the thorns, painful and dangerous, would discourage such animals from eating the berries. So where should we look to answer this natural riddle? Dr. Christine Tillish sighed and rubbed her eyes. She knew where the answer was, of course. Humans had selectively bred bramble plants as a sort of natural barbed wire to keep large animals out of their fields. This didn't stop mice and other smaller animals from spreading the fruit, so the plants still prospered. Still, this is a book about the evolution of plants. She had to squeeze in every iota of excitement she could. The snow was beginning to pile up outside, glinting and glistening in the glow of the streetlights. Christine would much rather be at home at this time, cozying up to her boyfriend with a lovely cup of tea. But she had deadlines to meet. She couldn't work anywhere but her office. At least it's warm, I suppose. Her office had to be, to keep her several rarer specimens alive. They were tropical plants, some of them nearly one of a kind. Her philodendron millicoscrum had been growing quite nicely, the leaves now almost as big as her, and the euborbria ritacta was climbing along its host plant quite nicely. And of course there was the... Christine paused. There was an empty spot in the collection, right where her newest addition had been. 
She believed it to be an unclassified species. She'd only found out about it by pure chance. A, a friend of hers in Haiti had asked her to take a look at a strange flower they'd found on a neighboring island. She'd never seen anything like it. it. It looked like an orchid, but far too large and with strange roots. She'd asked her friend to take a cutting and deliver it to her. She was right. It might be a whole new genus of plant. So where on earth was it? It's far too late for anyone to be around, and it couldn't have just got up and walked away. Christine saved her work and shut down the computer. She had a feeling that solving this would take a while. The university turned the lights off after nine to save power, so Christine had to work with just her phone's torch and the dim light from outside. The empty building should have scared her, but Christine preferred it that way. She got along well with her colleagues, but there was something calming about the silence and the dark. That was until she heard a noise, almost like a scuttling but softer and dragging across the floor. Slowly turning, she saw a small shape dragging itself quickly towards a dip in the biology condom room. I suppose if this was a film, I'd shout, who's there? Christine mused as she reached into her bag and pulled out what looked to be a small black USB. She smiled at the thought. I don't think so. Instead, she crept around the corner and peered into the room. Sitting just below the table was her specimen. Its large conical bud was pointed at the table, its roots and vines sitting limply on the floor. Christine scanned the room for signs of movement before returning her gaze to the plant. Wait, has it moved? Sure enough, as Christine watched the plant's vines begin to move of their own accord, they reached upwards, grasping the edge of the table and gently began to pull the main body upwards. After a few moments, the plant had climbed all the way up and made its way to a bowl on the table. It thrust its bud in and began shuffling around, like a dog nosing through a bush. As cautious as she, as cautious as she was, Christine couldn't help herself. She had to see what was going on. Taking a few gentle steps closer, Christine got a slightly better view. The plant had its bud deep in a fruit bowl. Somebody had left that there. Its bud had opened up and was now being used almost like a pair of jaws, picking up some of the smaller fruit and devouring them. It couldn't fit around the apples and oranges, but there were some blackberries left at the bottom of the bowl that the plant was happily eating away at. Christine was rapt, all her attention focusing on the plant. Then suddenly, and without warning, it began to shiver. She watched as its whole body suddenly became slightly larger, and bramble-like thorns sprouted across it. No, not bramble-like. Bramble thorns. It had eaten a blackberry and sprouted bramble thorns, it was copying the plant. Christine could barely contain her excitement. Not only did this plant appear to be sentient, but it seemed like it could assimilate and copy desirable traits from what it devoured. She took another step closer. A mistake. The plant suddenly wheeled around. It had no eyes, but she could feel it looking at her. As the bud opened and showed rows of sharpened thorns like teeth, it leapt at her, angling directly for her face. If this was a film, I'd probably be done for. Christine thought as she pulled the tiny USB in front of her. She pressed a small button and the compact taser sparked with electricity. The plant flew right into it and began spasming before dropping onto the floor. Christine bent down and looked over the thing, still shaking, but not dead. She smiled. Oh, little one, I'm going to have so much fun with you. Oh no. Yeah, that's the it. The plant is alive. I was so sorry for Christina. Now I'm sorry for this poor plant. <laughs> yeah, a good switch of, of protagonist almost. Uh, mm. As I was writing I was as I was writing this, I realized I'd almost I'd accidentally written a cold open for like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> and I decided <laughs> I decided it would be much better to turn it on its head at the end. Oh. Mm. I love that yeah, the repeating of if this was a film, this would happen. It's very sort of self conscious thank you and it's it's like um what is that horror movie that does it it's scream isn't yeah it? i think that it's scream yeah. to different movies consciously mm. it just makes it more creepy <laughs> i had this idea sort of very very much on a whim because i like i said i i looked up blackberries and brambles this morning and found um uh found the the thing i wrote at the beginning about them being uh sort of a dichotomy in nature uh and then that sort of somehow mm. spiraled into plant monster <laughs> Um, <laughs> and it, it feels very much like the sort of thing I want to continue at some point. Yes. I would definitely uh, love to hear more. Plausibly switching protagonists and with Christine taking up more of an antagonistic role. Oh, please rescue the plant. 
I feel so bad for it. It's a murder plant, though. It's not. It was just eating blackberries. It wasn't doing anyone any harm. And then it was eating humans. That's a bit no, of harm. It, it was frightened and defended itself. <laughs> Although, okay. the question question I almost wanted to answer on the way that out, but I couldn't because I preferred this ending was if it gets properties of what it eats, what happens when it does eat a person? Uh, well, I, I was just going to oh, ask, no. is, the, is the big twist at the end that Christine is actually another one of these plants and is just getting rid of the competition? You, you'll, you'll have to read the novel to find out. <laughs> you guys are terrifying. <laughs> uh, can I just uh, congratulate you, uh, Alex, on being able to read those long scientific names? Thank just the you. ease yes. and yeah, you just pronounce them perfectly and I just stared at them going, I'm so glad I don't have to read this. I, I was almost certainly wrong with the pronunciation, but as long as it sounds confident, people probably won't notice. See see I wouldn't even have questioned. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm glad then. <laughs> I just loved as well the sort of the very relatable atmosphere. You seem to basically take the feeling of staying up late in the library you put it into a little vial and you injected it into this piece it really had that atmosphere in it oh, thank you yeah injected I... murderous plants into it a little bit of murderous plants yeah. <laughs> i really wish my plants came alive when i was doing coursework they could probably help me with it yeah, that's very fair to be honest it'd be, it'd be nice to have like a little cactus buddy just writing ideas next to you Oh, that would be brilliant. If my plants could speak, though, they would, well, scream as they die from over or under watering. I... Mine would probably just yell at me for not watering them enough if I take it all yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they would be so upset. They'd be like, oh, why are you putting a tea bag in my soil when what I really need is a bit more nitrogen? I'd be like, I'm sorry, that's just what the stupid little Facebook video told me to do. <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's good to know if your your plants ever do come alive, the, they will both become monsters. They they would want to kill me pretty quickly, I think. <laughs> and I've killed enough of their brothers and sisters by accident. You know, I think it's <laughs> that's a fair wish. Is Izzy story could be some kind of you know Jacobean tragedy where you know the last survivor yeah. comes back on a on a mission to avenge its its fallen comrades. Mm. They put Izzy in a pot Ooh. and forget to uh, to forget to water her. <laughs> Izzy, I'd come and rescue you, I promise. Thank you, Erin. And speaking of comrades and things, Erin, you are my comrade. How do you say that? Comrade? Comrade? comrade. I, I, I think it might be comrade. I might have said it wrong. Both, both I think, can work. Well, Erin can work. Erin does do work. So let's go to Erin's piece. Okay. Um, and Malik, awkward and slightly anxious is the energy I would like you to channel, please. Wonderful. Real life. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whenever you're ready, Izzy. Birdsong. Cars drive by. Footsteps walk on gravel. <sighs> okay. They knock on the door. We hear movement inside before it opens. Hi. There's a long pause. Is it... You You. You know me, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know you. Good. Oh, good, because I'm, I'm still waiting for the first time we meet and I'm always worried it'll be the next time and I'll have to introduce myself and you know I'm terrible at... They break off as they are hugged. Whoa, okay. It's good to see you too. There's a rustle of clothes as the hug ends, followed by an awkward cough. <laughs> um, sorry. How long have I been gone? Maybe you should come in. The door shuts. Um, tea? Uh, of course. There is a clink of cups. You look different. Older. You don't? Haven't aged a day? Yeah, well, immortality is good for the skin. How long... Well, how long was I gone? A while. How long's a while? Would you like to sit down? A chair scrapes across the floor. Let's start with something simple. What were you doing before you moved? Picking blackberries in your garden. Then then time did its wobbly thing and I was down the street. How different did the street look? Very. And, and you didn't have glass back doors before and they were wood. Uh, and Ah, you 
You don't have blackberries in your garden. No. I went backwards in time. Looks like it. And how long has it been since you last seen me? The kettle boils, the sound of pouring water. How long? Eighty years. Oh. The cups are put on the table. Another chair is scraped back. Did you uh, did you make records for what I missed? They're in the filing cabinet upstairs. Ooh, you got a bigger one? I get a bigger one? We're, we're, we've not got to that yet, have we? Not yet. Right. Well, I want to see everything you've done with your life. Do you mind if we we don't do this now? Can we just talk first? You're freaked. I am not. You're, you're doing that weird thing where the vein on your forehead pops up. Uh, fine, fine. I'm freaked. Happy? Not really. Now I'm freaked. I know you're... <sighs> sorry. I'm sorry. 80 years is a long time. Not for you. It's always a long time without you. I always come back. Yeah, eventually. Last time we were going through the filing cabinet, you blipped out while holding photos of my new cat. The cat? Galacat? Galahoot? No, he was called Excaliper. I think. It's hard to keep track of cats over the centuries. Uh, I've, I've not met him yet. You'll love him. He used to sit on your lap and go to sleep. I, I mean, he will. I mean... Oh, ten- tenses are weird. <laughs> yep. You still have all the photos? You had a few in your hand when you blipped, but I have a couple. I'd love to see them. If I go upstairs and get them, will you still be here when I get back? Another pause. Actually, would you mind... Coming with you? There's a sound of a cat purring. Oh, who's this? (laughs) Perlin. Ah, yeah, keep this one away from trees. Really? She has a fall. Only when she's bigger, but she gets grumpy after that. I'll add it to the list. Come on, let's get those photos. Erin, the cat names! The cat names! Oh my god, it was so sweet! (laughs) The hardest thing about this was the cat names, oh my god. Brilliant. Can you please name all of my future cats? That was amazing. (laughs) I got so stuck after (laughs) Perlin! Please, please, please tell me there will be one uh, called Arthur Poor Dragon. Oh, well, there will be now. Oh. <laughs> that was so cute. I love the comfortableness between them, and I love that the time traveller has been gone for 80 years, and the partner just isn't even angry at them at all. Well, it's not their fault, you know? Yeah, exactly. I love that they've sort of worked that out in their relationship. <laughs> they've had those conversations. Yeah. Oh, it was, and they, also, they will have those conversations. Yeah, exactly. The, the <laughs> meeting up in the wrong order. I, I, I love that so much. The, uh, yeah, not, mm. not quite having the same memories of the relationship. They'll, they'll get there. I was thinking if it was a screenplay, it almost reminds me uh, of the film Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, where... Jim Carrey's character is, is in a dream for most of it and he's going through his relationship, but he sees it very sort of fractured and at different stages. So if this was a film, it would be really cool to see this couple at different stages where one of them remembers certain things and the other one doesn't and you're not mm. never quite sure uh, sort of what time you're in. So, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I guess you'd have to pick one of their perspectives to follow because trying to follow both of them would be <laughs> very, very difficult. Series one is one perspective and series two is the second perspective. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just loved their relationship. I loved everything that they worked out and the way that they sort of chatted to each other and that they hugged when they came in as well. It was so cute. I, I also really enjoyed the, the very casual sort of making a list of things to watch out for in your eternal life. That was very, very cool. Oh, like keep away that one cat from a yeah. car. It's going to get so annoyed after that, and I just can't be bothered to deal with that again. (laughs) The joys of grumpy cats. (laughs) Um, Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, I've got a segue. Speaking of cats, Izzy has a cat. Uh I do. Let's let's go on to Izzy's piece. Yes, let's do my piece. Oh, I'm excited. I do have a cat, I love her. She's cute. I think the cat's appeared on the Instagram many, many times. Mm. She just does, because she's a lot more photogenic than (laughs) anything else I have, including my face. And so I just take pictures of her all the time. And then I'm like, the world must see this, because she's very cute. (laughs) 
so my piece, I took an approach pretty similar to Alex, actually. I just basically looked up all of the myths that I can about blackberries. And there are a lot of sort of Irish myths and stuff like that. And I tried to kind of use them in here. But this piece overall, it's like a fairy tale mystery. So see if you can pick up the clues and work out what's happened. Because this is part one of the mystery. After Puka comes, don't eat blackberries. Don't damage the bush, it's home to fairies. Brambles mimic the curve of the reaper's scythe. A wish granted when you pass three times. I wish for our patrol to be fed. The first wisher declares a beat after the song. The patrol echo the wish from the treetops above as the wisher crawls underneath the arch of the brambles thrice. Scratches thread through his skin, so he plucks a blackberry from the bush and smears it on his wounds. Juice kisses blood. Fruit blooms on the branches the patrol sit on, and deer leap into the archer's range. We're going to need a roaring fire tonight, Neve says as an apple grows into her hand. Connor reties his end of the twine that ropes him and his sister together. That's what you should wish for. I should, Neve says, climbing closer to the crest of the oak for a better view of the wishing. But you know I won't. Connor places a hand on her shoulder. You promised you would try something different this time. Neve shrugs. If you waste another wish, they'll throw you out, Connor says. Neve bites down on her apple. But if my wish is granted, Chief will be our next king. The second wisher slides down from its sycamore, and the patrol bursts into song. After Pooka comes, don't eat blackberries. Don't damage the bush, it's home to fairies. Brambles mimic the curve of the reaper's scythe. A wish granted when you pass three times. I wish for clean water. The second wisher declares a beat after the song. Boring. Neve mutters, and Connor hides his laughter beneath the echoes of the wish. The second wisher is leaner than the first, so passing under the arch thrice only draws one drop of blood. She smears a blackberry across her face until juice kisses blood. The earth splinters into streams clearer than diamonds. The wisher dips a cupped hand under the stream and lifts it to her lips. She nods, wades through the stream and lets her sisters pull her back up into their sycamore. Water pools around the trunk of Neve's oak. How am I supposed to get down now? She moans. Connor shuffles to the outer stretch of the branch above his sister, loops their rope around and hops onto the branch below. Neve eases her weight onto the twine, and Connor lowers her until it is safe to jump. He hops around the streams, then stands before the arch. Chief shakes his head at her from the highest tree. The patrol begins their song. After Pooka comes, don't eat blackberries. Don't damage the bush, it's home to fairies. Brambles mimic the curve of the reaper's scythe. A wish granted when you pass three times. I wish for you to show us the king's remains. Neve declares a beat after the song. The patrol groan. The spirits of the brambles refuse to grant that wish, remember? Choose another. The chief commands. Neve ducks under a pear aimed at her head. We've been searching for five years and found nothing. The spirit's power grows stronger day by day and we need all the help we can get. Perhaps the spirits do not know where he is. It is a queen's duty to hide her late husband's remains so well that only the most cunning in the kingdom can find it. That is why the finder is crowned. The chief says. Neve bows to the chief. I hope you'll forgive me, but we have to try. We left our villages because we genuinely believe you should be the man to find the remains. You heard reports of how fractured our kingdom has become since King Declan passed. Factions hoarding grain, raising our villages, burning of our forests. You are the only one who can bring stability back. But first you must find where the Queen buried him and you need help. Neve dives under the arch. She crawls through three times and emerges with a gash through her lip. Juice kisses blood. Fruit blooms. Water flows. But the third wish is denied. She threw away our last wish. She should be drowned in the river where she stands. Aiden shouts from the silver birch as he hurls another pair her away. Neve crawls underneath another three times, then another, then another, until finally the blood oozes from her face so thickly that she falls unconscious. To be continued. Ooh, very mysterious. Are these people fairies? They're... Yes? Sort of. They're more sort of... I'm thinking that they're humans who are kind of very attuned to the sort of fairy magic. There are fairies in this world. Mm. I was going to ask then if they're leprechauns, but maybe not. (laughs) But the mystery is, I suppose, why didn't the brambles do anything for this wish? Mm. My immediate thought was something along the lines of that the king's not actually dead. 
I was just thinking that. Oh. Yeah, like the, the, like the wish can't be granted because there's something wrong with asking for, the, asking for where the king's body is. Or I don't know, the king yeah, has no theory. body? He was burned? <laughs> <laughs> Either the king has ascended or he's still using his body, body. and you can't have it. My, yeah. my <laughs> thought is that this, this chief character is very mysterious and seems to have like sort of even more connection to the spirits than these people. So I'm wondering if if somehow the chief was involved in the king's death and he's somehow mm. influencing it so that everyone doesn't find the body because that will somehow implicate him. But, but in such a way that it will be very obvious when when they find the body that's him it's just it's just got the word chief did it <laughs> written, <laughs> written on his chest. <laughs> Like a, like a Death in yes. Paradise style, like we find the body and they <laughs> carve the initials into the dirt or something. Yeah, I've kept it very ambiguous as to how the king dies. I reckon that might be something for the next instalment, maybe. I'm so very I, excited to, to find out more. I, I love this sort of fairy tale esque kind of story. I really love the, the, the blackberries and the, uh, the sort of the passing, but passing beneath it three times that you know if you're if you're thinner you can get through with only a scratch but you, you need to give something up for a wish i think that's something that they actually believed in which is really cool they used to do it for they believed that if they passed their wounded underneath an arch of blackberries three times then um that would heal their sick basically oh very mm. interesting there's so many cool myths mm, there yeah. Always, yeah there's always some brilliant ones out there mm. Look, we're coming towards the end of today's show. So thanks to especially Alex and Sophie for joining us today. And obviously thanks to Erin for joining every day. Hello. <laughs> so thank you yeah, no, it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope you both like develop your pieces because I would really love to see what happens next in both of them. I have them. a horrible I'm... feeling I'm going to turn mine into a D&D game at some point and I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> I would like yeah. updates on this game, please. <laughs> I will be thinking about yes. that Blackberry mystery for a while mm, now. I might have yeah. to keep messaging you with theories about what I think has <laughs> happened or what's going to happen. All the clues are there, so <laughs> hopefully... The, the truth yeah. is out there. The truth is there, mm. yeah. Protected by a mutant Blackberry plant in a hut by a lake. The, the real twist is these are all part of the same expanded the same universe. universe well you know maybe maybe the place where where louis and simon go used to be like a you know an old sort of pagan ritual place so maybe we should all just start writing this you know mm. cinematic expanded universe <laughs> poor, poor and there's louis, time just, travel just... involved um poor time travel dude is is stuck you know being sacrificed by pagans and has to has to run back to his own time could be the main character <laughs> Poor Louis just trying oh, to cut that. cut through, and then this like magical chief just walks through his door. Like, right, we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that happened I... just after the story ended. I didn't tell you guys. Can I finish my smoothie first? No. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that. But yeah, thank you so much for all of our writers on today's show, and thanks so much to everyone for listening. And happy birthday to Prompted. So, for more prompts and writing, find us on Instagram on at Prompted Writing Podcast and our YouTube, which is Prompted Writing Podcast. And thank you so much for listening. Hit the outro. Mm-hmm.